the question always comes up on the subject of the destruction of the ego. And uh, I said that a good deal of the master's teacher is directed at destroying the personal ego, that is, the personal sense of I. And uh, you can see how that is accomplished when you are continuously realizing, I can of my own self do nothing, the Father within me with ways. Or, if you were to do a great deal of healing work, very soon you'd find that you'd almost settle into a routine when you sat down to treat of saying, well, Father, you know, I don't know anything about this healing business. I wouldn't know how to heal a pimple from a corn. So please uh, take over. And I mean, you get into that attitude of saying, well, now, Father, what do I know about delivering a baby? You see? Well, for instance, the case I was called on in uh, Los Angeles of a breech case with a baby turned wrong into, and the doctor's unable to turn it around and bring delivery. And then they called me on the phone from the delivery room. And now I ask you what I'm going to do 20 miles away uh, about a breech case and how I'm going to turn a baby around and you'll know that what has to happen to you, how completely the ego must be destroyed when you realize I can do nothing or think nothing that will have any effect on an unconscious mother and an unborn baby, do you see? And if you can get completely enough unself so that you really know in your heart and soul that you can't do anything, then the very thing that happened takes place. The baby turned itself around and delivered itself with no human aid. To such an extent that the doctors and the nurses called me the next day and said it was the first such delivery they had ever seen. And it was wonderful. Now, nobody, nobody could ever lay claim to the ability to deliver a breech case or to remove a cancer or to heal uh, decayed lungs. I mean, that would be the height of folly for any practitioner or teacher or spiritual uh, person to believe that they had any such power. And it's only in the degree that you realize your lack of power do you become unselfed enough for the spirit to flow. Do you see that? Now, uh, when uh, he tells us not to uh, avenge ourselves, or even if we're sued at law, not to sue back, but to give them all they want and to add something to it. What is he saying there except get rid of that word I? Don't let the I come in with what it would love to do and how it would love to protect itself and its uh, supply. Okay? Now, when uh, you can become unselfed enough so that you can say, all right, I can get along without supply. I came into the world with nothing, I'll go out with nothing, maybe I can get along in between with nothing. Then you can become unself enough to, to say, this is God's universe. If you want coconuts on a coconut tree, put them there. Don't ask me to do anything about it. Now, in the same way, when he says, agree with thine adversary, don't fight error. He is saying, don't defend yourself and uh, neither use the weapons of offense or defense. Just think how stripped you are. When every bit of offense and defense is taken away from you, there's no more I. Do you see that? Now, uh, you can say then that his teaching largely is made up of just what the old oriental teacher teaching was, the destruction of the ego. The oriental, however, destroyed himself. He made himself an nonentity, not knowing that his self was God, even while he declared that the one self is God. Nevertheless, he destroyed himself by making the self nothing. You see that? He just eliminated this universe. He eliminated himself. He let his body decay. Well, there is a place in between asceticism 
and the destruction of the false ego that brings to light the I that I am. And then you have the divine ego. Then you can say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You see? To God, well, yes, God can set a table in the wilderness. Why then be an ascetic and not want a table set in the wilderness? Why deny yourself food? If God can set a table in the wilderness, it must be because he wants us to eat. You see that? Well, <clears throat> when you come to a spiritual teaching, then, you overcome the false sense of ego, but you for show forth the ego which I am. Then you glorify God, uh, not man. You see, now, every bit of power and dominion that we show forth in our healing work, supplying work, protective work, is showing forth the glory of God, not of a man, because it's free to anyone and everyone. It isn't a personal gift that one can have and not another, because it has nothing to do with a person. It has to do with a person setting themselves aside that the capital S self can come into expression. Well, I meant to say this to you this morning, that just as I asked on the first morning, that this group constitute itself a group of practitioners uh, and take over some of the responsibility of, uh, for the success of the infinite way. So I wanted to elaborate on that a little bit this morning to show how it's done. Because just as you would say, and rightly, that for the last seven years, Joel has carried the message of the infinite way, has carried it all over and uh, planned its writings or its recordings or been at the forefront and so forth and so on. So you would have to say now that uh, Emma has developed and worked out this tape recording business and is at the forefront of that and has done a magnificent job with it. But so you would have to say that Mrs. Mayberry has worked on this mail and manuscript work and monthly letter work and done a magnificent work. And so you would think at first that in supporting this, that you're being called on to support me or Emma or Mrs. Mayberry. And that isn't what I mean, because it may not be in God's plan for me to be at this particular point uh, any further, or it may not be that Emma will continue in the recording work or Mrs. Mabry will continue in the manuscript or mail work. That is a thing for God to decide and plan, not for you. So it isn't a support for me or a support for her or a support for her that I ask. It is uh, the very opposite of that. What I ask is the realization that God is the principle of uh, the infinite way and that God is able to raise up seed. Now, why do we care what happens to Joel or Emma or Ruth? Why do we care what happens to Mrs. Holmes? If she wants to retire, isn't that her privilege? Hasn't she worked faithfully for years and years and years? Isn't she entitled at some time or other to retirement? Certainly. Why then should we work to be sure that Mrs. Holmes stays at her post just because she's done a good job? No. Let us work to know that God uh, is at the post, you see? And then uh, if God continues to work through Mrs. Holmes for a thousand years, we're grateful. But if God decides to let Mrs. Holmes retire, we're not going to be left alone. If Mrs. Mabry wants to change her mode of life or address, should we uh, interfere with that? No. If my period of retirement comes, or passing on to a higher plane or a different plane of activity, should that affect the infinite way? No, and it won't. If our students understand the Master's teachings, you will understand what is meant by, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. Now, in doing... Uh, spiritual work in the nature of prayer and communion for the infinite way, you don't have to be concerned about me or Emma or Ruth or Mrs. Holmes 
or uh, Misinkla in Chicago. As a matter of fact, you don't even know the names of those in many of the places who are carrying on the work. So you couldn't personalize your treatment. Well, now, if you can't personalize your treatment for Chicago or Cincinnati or Detroit, why bother to personalize it about Honolulu or New York? Do you see? Then, uh, in impersonalizing your work, you would forget all the towns in this country and all the people associated with the work, and you would be realizing God is the principle of the message of the infinite way, and God is able to set a table in the wilderness, and God is able to raise up seed. And so God fills all space, and God completes all the activity of the infinite way. And if you were to keep your treatment or prayer or communion on that level, we would have 10,000 workers very quickly. Do you see now the nature of impersonal work? Well, now remember this, that that is what I have been trying to teach about healing work. Don't be concerned about the name of your patient or what is troubling them because that doesn't enter the treatment at all. What you're to concern yourself with is the word God. God is the principle of this universe. God is the principle of all creation. God is the life and the mind and the soul. Well, if you live in that consciousness, anyone who reaches out to you will be benefited. This experience happened here just within this month. A woman in Canada sent a cable to Hollywood, to me, for help. And it was a serious claim in that the woman was unable to walk and had been in that condition for some time. Well, the cable was forwarded to me by, by mail from Los Angeles. But in the same mail with the cable was a letter from the uh, lady in Canada enclosing a very generous check and saying for the first time she had experienced a real healing in her metaphysical career but an outstanding one that was a miracle and she was going on vacation with her husband and able to walk. I hadn't even received the cable. You see that? That is the impersonal nature of uh, spiritual work even before they call he knoweth your needs is that a true statement or was the master mistaken now if god knows your need even before you call he certainly knows your need before i get the call and he certainly hasn't empowered me to take over his job of helping you and therefore any moment that you say i'm going to write joel the healing should be instantaneous and at that second. And if it isn't, it should come to you sometime between the time of the message being on its way and the answer being returned. Because it is not necessarily dependent on my receiving the message or on your receiving the physical answer. Now, the reason this is true is this. That ever since I discovered the impersonal nature of the Christ, I have known that what does the healing work is an individual's realization of God as the principle of the universe. In other words, you can get a better healing from Jesus Christ than you can from his disciples. Why? Because of his greater realization of God as the principle. They had attained it in some degree, but not nearly the degree that he had attained it. And so, in turning to him, even though you couldn't reach him physically or personally, his state of consciousness would bring the answer. And so it is. Many, 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 it's into the hundreds, probably into the thousands, of those who have written or cabled me and had their help before I was aware of it, and certainly before my letter could get back to them. And the reason is that in this work, there is no transference of thought. I never transfer truth to you. I never enter your mental household to try to give it a message of truth. I merely maintain my contact with God. And when you reach out to me, you not only reach out to me 
that you not only reach me, but you reach God. Because I'm dwelling consciously and I and the Father are one. And it doesn't make a difference whether I'm sitting here conducting a class or whether I'm sitting at a meal. Back here there's an area of my consciousness that doesn't come out here and doesn't live out here. It stays right back there in a conscious oneness with God. Now, uh, I don't very often slip far enough out of that oneness to get very far away that I can't slip back pretty quickly. And all those who have been around me very much personally know that that's the truth. That usually I'm way, way back there. Even though out here I may be in the world. Back there, I'm not of it. And that is the reason why you can reach. And you'll find not merely me, but you'll find God. Because there's a conscious oneness established. Now then, you begin with that same idea that I and the Father are one, all that the Father hath is mine. Meaning that all of the divine consciousness of the Father is the divine consciousness of me. Meaning that all of the spiritual power of God is the spiritual power of me because we're one. I'm the instrument through which it's all pouring. And as you maintain that, gradually, slowly, gradually, it dawns on you and it becomes not an intellectual agreement but one day you slip over. It's as if you went from one world into another. I call it a transition is made. When this is no longer an intellectual truth and you don't declare it anymore. It's an established fact. It's a state of being. And just as you would never go around saying, I am a good man or I am honest or I am spiritual or I am pure, you, you know right well, you'd be suspicious of anybody called Honest Jack. And uh, so you'd be suspicious of anyone who said, I am spiritual and I am perfect and I am one with God. You'd know right well that they didn't know it. Otherwise, why would they be reciting it to themselves? And so you come to a period of transition when never again do you make a declaration of truth. But truth is continuously pouring into you and reminding you. You get off the beam once in a while, but if you're just patient, it'll come back and say, I didn't leave you. I wasn't away anywhere. Uh, sometimes you even have problems come up. And you'll think, probably like the Master did in Gethsemane. I'm in trouble. Why don't you watch with me one hour and get me out? He wasn't in trouble, but he succumbed to the temptation of believing that he was. He really wanted this trouble to pass from him. He wasn't in trouble. He was about to be given the opportunity by God to show forth the supreme demonstration. But he wasn't sure at that moment whether it was or whether it was a failure to maintain his contact with God. And in that moment of uncertainty, he wanted all the disciples to help him. And he even wanted to pass from him if it could. Later on, he realized, of course, that uh, it wasn't, the crucifixion wasn't a lack of demonstration. The crucifixion was a demonstration over death. It wasn't death. It was a demonstration over death. And so we get a problem sometime, and we think it's a problem when it's an opportunity to demonstrate over the belief of an activity or selfhood or condition apart from God. Now then, one thing, of one thing you may be sure. There is only one way to overcome personal ego. And that is to come to a place in consciousness where you have no concern for your own affairs. In other words, there's no great credit in demonstrating a lot of supply because it isn't your demonstration, it's God. There is no disgrace in demonstrating no supply because that may be the part that you're called upon to play at a given moment for some reason in your experience. One of the greatest blessings that can come to a person in uh, this work is to be brought to a position where they have an absolute knowledge that God brought about this demonstration where there is no question in their mind that it couldn't have been humanly achieved like the baby in the breech case. Nobody that witnessed that 
doubts for a second that they saw the hand of God move the baby. Do you see that? Nobody doubts that. So that particular case was a blessing. It wasn't a curse either for the doctors or the mother or the baby. It was a blessing. It showed at least five people that the hand of God, even though invisible to sight, is a very present power and can move around in your body. Do you see that? So it is. To be in a position like Rickenbacker, where his checkbook is no good to him in the middle of the Pacific, and there are no supermarkets, and to say, and yet I'm convinced that we're not going to meet a, miss a meal. And then to see the fish jump up into the boat and the birds come down and give themselves up, would he trade that experience for all his check accounts? No, because there's no doubt in his mind now that God is. And that God is even in the midst of the Pacific, not just where you're close to somebody that can give you a check. That's a fine thing to prove that God is because somebody is available. But just think what it is when nobody's available to give you a check and still meals come on time. Do you see that? Now, only in that way can the ego be destroyed. Now, so it is. It might be a fine thing to sit here and know some truth to you and say, Oh, Ruth, you are spiritual. Ruth, you are perfect. Ruth, you are harmonious. Ruth, you are God's perfect child. And then five minutes later, hear Ruth say, Oh, I feel fine. Well, that might be fine. You might be able to do this after that. But just think how much finer it is and how much closer you are to the kingdom of heaven when you forget you and you forget Ruth and you just sit and say, uh -oh, can't accept this. I've seen too clearly that God is. And I'm going to stand on that. God is. There you are. There's no ego. Now, when uh, the patient says, Oh, I feel fine, you can really say with the Master, I did of my own self do nothing. The Father within me did that work. You see? All right. Now, let us acknowledge for a moment that the infinite way has been introduced into human consciousness not by a man but by God because the time had come for it and that Joel was just a part of the human consciousness that had received uh, this light just as others now are receiving the same light all right are they receiving it from Joel or from uh, the consciousness of the infinite way well if you could read my mail and see how up in Sweden a group of 15 women are studying the infinite way without my ever knowing that there was such a group there or get a letter from uh, Selma, Alabama saying we are a group of uh, students who uh, meet once a week to study the infinite way and I don't even know there is such a group you will know that Joel isn't doing it God is doing it do you see that? well that's so it is all we have to do is keep knowing that God is at the helm of the infinite way. That God is introducing this principle into human consciousness. And then there'll always be a Joel, and there'll always be an Emmer, and there'll always be a Ruth, and there'll always be a publishing house, and there'll always be somebody else. We had another instance of the impersonality of that right here in Honolulu when it came for our letter work. Now, the lady who, who really is responsible for getting out the entire mechanical end of it the production of the letter the mailing of it the maintaining of the files is not a, ma a student of the infinite way and uh, ordinarily they say well how would you ever find her well just God took me up there and deposited me on the doorstep and she has turned out to be really super perfect there is just not a thing you can ask of that lady that isn't done almost as fast as you can ask it and all was done perfectly there are no errors in her work and the letter has gotten out promptly the files are kept beautifully and uh, I had nothing to do with it I was led I didn't know her and nobody recommended her I was led to her doorstep and she has just fallen hasn't she fallen you've seen it too fallen into line and we have no responsibility with the letter after the manuscript has turned out I have the uh, uh, first part of the responsibility in either writing them or finding them in the tapes and uh, then Mrs. Mabry has the responsibility of putting them into manuscript form and after that this office downtown here gets them right into your hands without us having a thing to do with it. Now, 
That is because God raised up seed to perform that work. You see? Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to sit around praying that Miss Fussfell keep on doing it forever because I frankly don't care any time that it outgrows Miss Fussfell or that she wants to do some other work. She has my blessing because uh, God raised her up and God hasn't reached the end of his resources. Do you see that? God raised Emma up for the tape work and God raised Ruth up for the manuscript work and God raised me up for my work. So don't be concerned what happens to us. God will raise up anybody and everybody necessary. So in doing the work for this activity, you don't have to be concerned about doing work for me as a person. Do the work to know that God is the soul and the principle of the message of the infinite way and God is able to raise up seed even in the desert. God can make a desert blossom as a rose. God could plant the infinite way in Russia. God could plant the infinite way in Rome. Why not? What can't God do? The only trouble is that too many of us are apt to think that maybe Joel ought to do it. And you see, Joel hasn't such capacities. Only God has. And Joel's capacities are only in proportion to his awareness that only God has the capacities and that he can serve as an instrument. Now, when you catch that clearly, you will also catch the secret of the healing work. The secret of the healing work lies in this, that you do not concern yourself with the person or personality of your patient or student, and do not be concerned with whether they tell you they have a cancer in the last stage or they have a cold in the first stage. Don't be concerned about those things, because humanly there's nothing you can do about them. A doctor could do something about them humanly, but you can't. Nothing you can do. The only one access, one power that you have access to, and that is spiritual power. And your spiritual power, you have access to only in the realization that you know that God is the principle of this universe. And that this universe is governed by a law. And it's a cosmic law. It doesn't make exceptions. It doesn't just benefit the good and leave the bad out in the cold. It just doesn't benefit the members of our group and leave out all of the heathens. Nobody is left out. The cosmic law shines like the sun for everyone. But of course, those who don't get out in the sun won't get tanned. That is sure thing. Those that don't get out in the sun won't benefit by the sun's warmth. So there, there is a question of the master saying, I am come only to those of my own household, meaning that I can really only benefit those who are of my state of consciousness. When uh, the centurion says, you don't have to go to my servant, just send your word, then the master says, of course, I have not seen such faith in all Israel. Here's a centurion got more faith than the Hebrews, and the Hebrews are supposed to be the only people on earth who had the real faith in the one God. And the same way to the Samaritan woman, who wanted help for her daughter. And he said, no, I've come only to those in my own household. But she implored and implored, and because of her much imploring, he healed her daughter. In other words, she showed by her state of consciousness that, that, that she was ready. She was actually then of Israel, even though she was only supposed to be a Samaritan woman. And so with the Samaritan woman at the well, oh, I'm shocked. Your Hebrews are not supposed to talk to us Samaritans. But he did, because he detected in her a readiness, and so, as far as he was concerned, she was of his own household. And in the same way, of course, harlots, adulterous women, they're not, not supposed to be of our household at all. They, they don't belong to our church. We don't let them have membership in our church, you know that. I don't know, we stone them and cast them out, but not the master. Oh, no, no, no. The moment, now he didn't go around... Uh, picking up all the harlots in Israel. But when he detected one or saw one who was ready to come out and be separate, he said, come on, join our band, you're of our household. Well, of course, the people who live on what your past were, they were shocked at that. Why, he's a friend of wine barbers and, uh, and sinners. No, he really wasn't. He was a friend of those who had had enough of wine bibing and of sinning and had discerned the nature of the Christ. 
If he had been a friend of sinners and wine bibbers, he would have gone down and hung out with them at the corner saloon, but that he never did. He wasn't a friend of theirs. He was a friend of those who were ready to leave their nets, who were ready to leave uh, their old ways. Now, so it is. We, too, do not proselyte. Our responsibility for the infinite way doesn't mean that we're to go out and proselyte for it. It means that we are to let our light so shine before men that men will want to come and partake of it. It doesn't mean that we're to go out any more than uh, sunshine goes around looking for dark rooms to light up. Oh, no. Or lighthouses. Lighthouses don't go around the ocean looking for ships to leave. They stand right still and let the ships come to them. And so with us. Ye are the light of the world. Now, keep that light so brightly burning through your own individual demonstration that others will come and say, what have you? Then they are of your household. Then they can be benefited. Now, it's all right to pray for our enemies. It's all right for us to sit in meditation and communion and know the truth about even those who are not yet of our own household. But let us stop our, at there. Let us know that God is also the principal of these human devils on earth. But let's not go and try to change those devils into angels. Wait for them to come and be turned. Then it'll be an easier job. And we'll have less of persecution. There isn't any real reason why should we should go through deep persecutions unless we go out into the world and try to reform it. And that's dangerous because you interfere with the other fellow's activity. He is getting along all right the way he is and he doesn't want that broken up. Now, <clears throat> this all has to do with the overcoming of the ego in the sense of losing your personal concern for your own life or the life of your friend or relative or patient. Don't be concerned for your own welfare because that is of no importance. The only thing that is of importance is what is the principle? Keep that principle before you, then your own welfare and your patients and your students will come along into line. But the moment you concern yourself with whether they are going to make progress or with whether they're going to get well, you are the blind leading the blind. Now, I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all men unto me. Now, what, how, how, <clears throat> what does uh, being lifted up, what is that constituted? Well, frankly, it's constituted of not caring about any person any patient, any student, or any relative. It means I, if I'm lifted up to the place where I understand that God is really the soul of this universe, the principle of it, the governing influence, the only influence, that God is the only power, I am abiding in the principle. Now that principle will take care of everybody. But the minute I come down from there and uh, try to take a human being and spiritualize them, I must fail. Because you cannot spiritualize mortal man. Mortal man has to die. You must die daily. And you must be reborn of the spirit. Now, the spiritual teacher must not try to prolong your mortal life. He must try to assist your death. And the way he does it is by ignoring your personal problems and, uh, and defects and abiding in the truth that God is the central theme of existence. God is the principle of all being. God is the life and God is the mind and God is the intelligence and God is the all one. And stay up there. Keep your conversation in heaven. Don't be a human do-gooder. Don't be concerned with whether the fever is 108 or 102 because they're just as mortal when it's 99 as when it's 108. Don't be concerned with that. Be concerned with the truth. Ye shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Oh, many, many times Christian scientists are considered very cold because they don't exhibit human sympathy. Well, 
if they understand their teaching uh, correctly, they're not cold and they're not indifferent, but they know what the principle is and they know that human sympathy and human love never heal anybody or save a life. You see, if human love would save anybody's life, no child would ever die, no parent would ever die. Because, uh, I mean, in the ordinary course of events, every parent loves a child so much that that love would prolong their life. Every child loves their parents so much that uh, they wouldn't let their parents die. And isn't that what humanhood is consisting of? Parents always trying to save their children and children always trying to save their parents. Yet where does it get them in the end? Nowhere. Now, the moment you can become indifferent not to your child, not to your parent. Indifferent to the appearance. That's the secret. Not indifferent to each other. In this work, if you didn't love each other supremely, you couldn't serve each other. And if you didn't love a lot, you couldn't engage in this work. It, it takes a lot out of you, and you get a lot of abuse in it. And if you didn't love people an awful lot, you wouldn't stay in it. You do love them a lot, but you ignore the appearances. That is uh, the destruction of the ego. When you can ignore the appearance, don't ignore man, don't ignore woman, don't ignore child, don't ignore the little dogs and cats and birds. Ignore the appearance concerning them and see through the appearance to the very heart and soul of that individual, you find Christ. Now that is what is misunderstood by the world. Somebody says to me, I'm in terrible pain and all right, all right, I'll take care of it. And they think that's terrible. Or they will say, rush out to the house right away. Rush out to the hospital right away. I had a call from a young man. And the sister's going to jump out the window and commit suicide. Come at once. I'm sorry, I'm too busy. Can't come. What? This woman is jumping out. We can't hold her back. I said, let her jump. Oh, oh, no, no. Well, if I come there and stop her from jumping out, why shouldn't she jump out tomorrow night? What's the difference between tonight, tomorrow night, next week? Oh, no, if she's got to jump any time, let her jump tonight and get it over with, and in a few weeks your grief will be all over. How can you talk that way? That's heartless. I don't think so. But anyhow, I can't come. If you'd like me to do some work, I'll be very glad to do it if you don't get somebody else. Well, all right, all right, go ahead, do the work. And at 12 o'clock that night, they telephoned me. They were all having a midnight lunch, and everything was hunky-dory. And I know the woman. She still hasn't committed suicide. And that's more than 10 years ago. Now, uh, you see, I wasn't heartless, and I wasn't ignoring the woman. Oh, no, no. I was ignoring the appearance. The appearance testified to a mind apart from God. To a will apart from it. Does God will suicide? Well, then who can will it? Ah, then there must be a will apart from God. Can God uh, will evil? No. Well, there must be a will apart from God. No, I don't accept the appearance of a will apart from God, or of a desire apart from God, or a selfhood apart from God, or a condition apart from God. So I don't ignore anybody. No, I love people too much. But, I ignore the appearance which confronts them and which, which they confront me. I ignore the appearance. See that? Now, you are not being unloving or unkind when you ignore the appearance. You are being spiritually on the beam. You know it took Jesus three days to go and raise Lazarus, who was a good friend of his? He wasn't a bit in a hurry. No, no, he was never. Do you know that Jesus would sometimes go away to the mountaintop for 40 days and leave all the people down on the plain here dying and sick? Didn't worry him one bit. He ignored all those appearances and just went off. When he had to meditate or commune with God, he did it. And he ignored all the appearances. On, and I suppose a lot of people thought that was heartless. Why didn't he just stay there 24 hours a day healing people? Well, in the end, he would have collapsed for the simple reason, unless there are periods of renewal, unless there are periods of going back within to the source of our good, we come to the end of it. 
It isn't that we come to the end of God. God can't come to an end, but we can come to the end of our realization. If we let the world pull on us and pull and drag and drag and drag, pretty soon there'll be a sense of depletion. There won't be depletion, it'll be a sense of depletion. But it'll act like depletion and we won't be able to help anybody. Nobody is ever helped by my physical presence. Never. They may get a little consolation from it, but they're never really helped or healed by my physical presence. They are helped and healed by my state of consciousness. And if they insist on my personal presence until they've worn it down, then there'll be no more help from them, and then they'll decide they need a new practitioner or a new teacher. No, it is the same always. Nothing is more loving than the Christ ministry, but nothing is more heartless in its disregard of appearances because of its understanding that since God is, the water on the desert can't be. There just can't be a snake in the rope. Because the nature of cosmic law is that it creates a rope and it doesn't put snakes in the rope. And that's all that's to it. So you can keep on seeing snakes all you want and you can be cruelly indifferent to that appearance. But that doesn't mean you're indifferent to what lies behind the appearance. You're only indifferent to the appearance. This is a valuable lesson. This is a valuable lesson. This will show you the intense love that you must have, not only for God, the great reverence that you must have for a God that can maintain such a perfect, harmonious, wonderful universe. And the love that we must have for all of God's creatures. And what a total indifference we must maintain toward every appearance that doesn't testify to truth. Otherwise, we're bearing fo false witness against our neighbor, but it's more serious than that. We're dishonoring God. We're saying God hasn't enough wisdom to run his own universe. We're saying God hasn't enough love to protect its own child. When we accept appearances. Now, the whole secret of healing work lies in one word. I've given this to classes before, but because it's so important, I'm going to repeat it. And uh, uh, closed classes do not catch this point, except the few in it who seem to be ready. But it's too difficult a point for most students to catch. The secret of healing work lies in one word, reaction. How do you react when the claim or appearance is presented to you? That determines the healing. If you can be as indifferent to the appearance as I am explaining to you today, you can have an instantaneous healing or a quick healing or a beautiful healing, depending on the receptivity of the patient or student. If, however, you react with the tiniest trace of doubt or fear or accepting the appearance or having a desire to help or heal, you see, that's where desire is all sin. If you have a desire to help or to heal, your reaction is wrong and you may have a long battle to win out. Now, I do have cases like one that has just come yesterday, a letter from a lady explaining how many years she studied the infinite way and how faithful she is and uh, uh, reminding me of my statement in Science and Health that the responsibility for healing is on the practitioner. Do I still believe that? And if so, why isn't she healed? Well, I'm not going to write a why, but I know why. I know why. I don't know why she wants to be healed. She's been very prominent in public work, and she's going to go back to that public work and show them how great she is. She isn't interested in healing for the glorification of God or the revelation of harmony, but she's got a lot of work to do in life. And she's going out to do it. It is very much like the answer that Orville Roberts made last year in San Antonio, Texas. He was staging a big healing revival there. And, uh, well, it was before he got there that all the notices were out and all of the uh, literature was out and, oh, there was going to be a tremendous outpouring. But one, letter, one lady wrote him a letter that she was very ill and doctors couldn't do anything for her 
and uh, she was going to come to his meetings and she wanted him to heal her because it was so important for her to be healed because her husband was an unbeliever and this was going to convince her husband not only that but she had some friends who were unbelievers and that would bring them all into Christ so you see Mr. Roberts how important it is that you heal me well Mr. Roberts wrote back to her and said I don't like to say this to you but I'm afraid that you've made your healing almost impossible I don't think you're going to get healed your motives aren't right there's only one motive for spiritual healing and that's to glorify God not to do something good for your husband or your neighbors besides that you have forgotten scripture that if you were raised from the dead they wouldn't believe as a matter of fact the only people who will believe in spiritual healing will believe in it before they ever see a healing because something inside of them will convince them that God is able to raise up see so people who can respond to spiritual healing are convinced of it before the healing but nobody is convinced by what they see and so he says your concern for your husband and your concern for your neighbors will just stand in the way of your getting a healing now if you are willing to leave your husband outside of heaven and leave your neighbors outside of heaven there may be a possibility of your getting in yourself whether she was healed or not I don't know but that is what I say to you about reaction if I care whether you're healed or not then I'm reacting wrongly because that should not be my concern my concern should be what is the principle the principle is God that's all I stand with that now the rest is up to your receptivity the master showed three states of consciousness barren soil rocky soil fertile soil and in this barren soil you can plant all the seeds you want but there'll be no fruitage rocky soil you can plant these seeds and you may get some sprouts but it won't last the first heavy sun that comes or the first heavy rain that comes or the first hailstorm that comes going to uproot it wipe it out fertile soil you plant these seeds and uh, they take root and you may only get a little shoot at first but if you're patient your tree will grow your blossoms will come your fruitage will come now everyone who comes to us he says not everyone who says Lord Lord really means it and so it is remember that it isn't all the people who come to us for healing that really and truly want it they don't want healing they want the stopping of their pains you see healing consists of a change of consciousness oh it isn't everyone who comes to us that wants their consciousness changed it isn't everyone who comes to us that wants to give up the material sense of life or the greed or the lust or, or the desire for revenge it isn't everyone who comes to us that wants to give up the things of the world it isn't everyone who comes to us that wants to give up their mad ambition for place and power and so forth no 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 and that's what the healing consists of the physical change is only a result of the change of consciousness and what did the master say about it they're afraid lest I heal them yes he didn't say they're afraid lest I stop their pain oh no they all want that they're just afraid lest I heal them lest I heal them of mad ambition of greed enmity envy lust jealousy that's where it's afraid. they want to hug these tatters of human emotion oh don't take away from me I want to indulge my child I don't care if I spoil it I don't care if I send it to the gallows with spoiling it but just let me cram it full of ice cream and chocolate and and uh, all the rest of these things and indulge myself in that child I don't care what happens to him ultimately they don't want to stop that oh no 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 don't do that they don't want to send their child out and say I'm gonna trust you in God no they're gonna walk along and hold its hand forever they don't want to be healed of that and so then they'll come to us and say oh I know you can heal me I know God can heal me through you what they mean is they know that God can take this pain away but very often it isn't true because if you can't take away that which is causing the pain you can't take away the pain 
And what is causing the pain? An erroneous state of consciousness. The wrong kind of soil, not a spiritual consciousness. Now, that gives us no privilege to judge, criticize, or condemn. I don't mean that no matter what state of consciousness we detect in a person, that we should refuse our work to them. Oh, no. I will stick by with a person, even such as I've described, ten years if necessary. As long as they'll reach out to me, I'll stand by with them. Because in the end, uh, the very fact that they're reaching out so persistently must mean that eventually they are, will be ready for a change of consciousness. So as long as they'll reach out to me, I'll stand by with them. The only thing is that in many cases, they won't stand by long. If they don't get the result that they outline, then my work is a failure. If I can't reduce the lump or if I can't stop the pain, to them my work's a failure and then they walk on. I had a letter here not too long ago from a woman who says that she wrote me about a year ago about her terrible condition, but now she's writing again to tell me she's not healed. Haven't heard from her that whole year. Of course, I, I'm all wrong. You see, my ministry's wrong because I don't live up to my advertising. She wrote me a year ago. She's not healed yet. Well, uh, I didn't turn her down. I said, oh, I'll help you again. As long as she will keep reaching out to me, I will help her. Why? As a person, I love her. Because behind all of this appearance, I don't know her humanly, but I mean, I don't know who she is, but personally, I love everybody, and uh, I, I know who they are and where they come from, and I'll ignore the appearance. But I also have the spiritual wisdom to know that if they do not permit their consciousness to be healed or changed, uh, that even though they did get rid of a physical claim, that is not the permanent thing. You see, the Master healed ten lepers. Only one came back to give gratitude, and he says, what become of the rest? Ah, oh, be careful, lest the worst thing come upon you. There are many, many, many people who do receive physical healings from our work without their attaining a change of consciousness. They receive that healing purely through our state of consciousness. But it's a seed buried in rocky soil. And it isn't going to last. Either that or some other claim will come upon them, or worse when the Master says. Don't get rid of one devil and let leave room for seven more devils to come in. And that's what very often happens. A person has a physical healing. And now they're so physically free they can go out and commit ten sins instead of one. And they just leave themselves open for seven devils. So that our main concern when asked for help is not what is your physical condition and not whether it's going to improve in an hour from now or six days from now. Our concern is only this, to stand in the principle of God as the principle of the universe, to stand in the principle of God as the soul of all being, God as the only law, the only power, the only substance, the only activity. And if I stand in that, the general average of my healing work will be good, and those who stick with me ultimately will find that they will be healed. In other words, they will have a change of consciousness. You can't add clean water to a vessel half full of dirty water and have all clean water. In other words, you can't fill a vessel already full and uh, you can't add new wine to old bottles and you can't add a spiritual consciousness to a material consciousness. If you cannot, with your spiritual seed, make the material consciousness die daily so that spiritual consciousness takes its place, you cannot permanently succeed. But to give a spiritual healing to a material person, you can't do it. You just can't add spirituality to materiality or mortality. What you can do through constant treatment, constant prayer, constant meditation, constant teaching, you can help your student or patient transform their consciousness. Be ye therefore transformed. Repent ye, turn ye, and live. See, all this means a giving up of the old selfhood, the Adam man, because 
the Adam man must die so that the Christ man can be born. But you know as well as I do that most of the people that come to you for help want to keep on living their same lives that they are, but they want to do it without pain. And they want to do it without poverty or unemployment. But give them employment and give them good health and give them supply, and they don't want their consciousness transformed. They don't want their daily life transformed. This is a pretty good life when you haven't got pain and you've got enough supply. But that will not work in our work. And so it is that we do not concern ourselves with the identity of a patient or uh, the name or nature of a claim. We don't react to that because that's the appearance. Actually, we know I am the Christ of God. There's no question about that in my mind. I am the Christ of God. But I also know that that is the same truth of you. I don't know to what degree you've realized it. I don't even know what degree you've realized it about me. So I certainly don't know what degree you've realized it about you, but I'll tell you as a principle that this is the truth. I am the Christ. And you are the Christ. Christ is the true identity of you. Now then, as long as I know that about you, I have no concern. You can't be sick and you can't die and you can't be sinful. That's utterly impossible. So all you're bringing to me is an appearance or a claim or a temptation. And if I yield to the temptation and accept the appearance at face value, the blind is leading the blind and nobody's going to get healed. But if I ignore the appearance, if I'm totally cold and indifferent to the appearance and stand on the truth, uh-uh, I know you who you are. Just like the fellow said to the master, I know who you are. You're the Christ, the Son of God. A healing must follow. Not merely a physical healing, but a transformation of consciousness. Now, that has been the secret of all my work, and I really learned this basis of it in my prison work. The moment I learned Christ was the identity of these prisoners, I never again had any desire to help them or change them or to reform them. None. I just went in there to tell them about their true identity. And it was so true that instead of 8, 9, 10, 11 coming, within six weeks there were 77 coming to hear about their identity. And at the end of a year, we had 200. And not only we had 200, we had 15 prisoners doing healing work in that prison. But by being totally cold and indifferent to their imprisonment and to what they'd been in prison for or whether they stayed in prison forever. My function in the prison is merely to reveal identity. Let that do its work. Wherever there's a transformation of consciousness, they will walk out free, and it's been demonstrated many times. And now right here in Oahu prison, we had this demonstration that whereas 18 boys should have come to here, 66 boys came to here. And instead of them being uh, mildly interested, why, only as late as yesterday, we sent uh, first, second, and third San Francisco lectures over there to Oahu Prison. They're diligently studying the books. More and more boys are writing for them, and they're talking it among themselves. Why? Not because I do any proselyting work, but because I go in there indifferent to the appearance. I'm not there to get any boy out of jail. I'm not there to make any sinful boys pure. No, no, no. I'm there like I'm here, only for one reason, to reveal your true identity. Now in the degree of my realization of it, you will have some measure of healing. But in the degree of your realization of it, your lives will be transformed. Jesus could walk this earth and heal a lot of people, but he didn't transform too many lives. No, only in the degree of their acceptance and their realization were their lives transformed. He fed multitudes, but he didn't change the lives of multitudes. No, part of those multitudes were there to crucify him. You see that?